By the late 1980s, Marvel Comics X-Men had proved not only to be the most popular title at the publisher, but the most popular title in the comics industry as well. Writer Chris Claremont teamed with such artists as Dave Cockrum, John Byrne, and Paul Smith to craft some of the most well-known story in the entire history of Marvel Comics. The comic proved so successful that it got two spin-off titles, New Mutants and X-Factor. And with those titles, it participated in two very successful crossovers, Mutant Massacre and Fall of the Mutants. 1989 would bring a third crossover and a third spin-off title, The Exterminators, and these storylines will all compete in Inferno. Now, if you've seen any of my other X-Men related reviews, then you know that they can get pretty dodgy and dense to get through sometimes. So, yeah, prepare for a whole lot of backstory. At this point, the X-Men had faked their deaths during the fall of the mutant storyline and were seeking refuge in Australia, which I guess doesn't count as part of the Marvel Universe. Sorry, Aussies. Anyway, the team was being led by Storm and had a lineup consisting of Wolverine, Colossus, Rogue, Psylocke, Dazzler, a mutant pop star, Longshot, a mutant teleporter who could bend his luck to his will, basically, and Havoc, the brother of Cyclops. Anyway, the group had also had a member named Polaris, who was Havoc's longtime love interest. Unfortunately, she had been possessed by a, an evil mutant named Malice and joined a group known as the Marauders. More on them later. X-Factor was a group formed by the founding members of the X-Men. It consisted of Cyclops, Beast, Angel, Iceman, and Jean Grey. More on her later. Anyway, the group's guise to the public was that they were mutant hunters who were rounding up mutants and turning them into the federal government. In reality, what they were doing is taking in wayward mutants and training them so that they could better function in society without being detected. Now, during the Mutant Massacre storyline, Team member Angel had his wings harpooned to a wall by a mutant whose name escapes me at the moment. And this resulted in his wings being amputated. This drove Angel into a depression in which he attempted to commit suicide. However, at the last second, he was absconded by the mutant villain Apocalypse and turned into one of his four horsemen, Death. Now, there's a group that forms in this story called the Exterminators, and they consist mainly of the mutants that X-Factor just happened to be taking in. They consist of Skids, a woman who can create force fields, Rusty Collins, a pyrokinetic who can control fire, Boom Boom, a girl who can create small explosive energy pellets, Richter, who can cause earthquakes, Artie, a small pink mute who can communicate via virtual holograms that he speaks, for lack of a better term, and Leech, who can nullify mutant abilities. There's also another member, but uh, we'll touch on him when we get to the story. The New Mutants were essentially the next generation of X-Men, a group of teenagers brought in to attend the Xavier School for the Gifted, though eventually they would actually come under the tutelage of Magneto, who at the time was thought to be reformed from his villainous ways. At this point, the team consisted of Cannonball, who could propel himself through the air at high speeds, Mirage, who could cast illusions, Magma, who had control over lava, Sunspot, a living solar battery, Wolfsbane, who could transform into a wolf-like creature, and Magic, who was the sister of Colossus and had the ability to teleport through the demonic dimension of Limbo via a series of special discs.
Now, most of you know that the classic X-Men story, The Dark Phoenix Saga, ended with X-Men member Jean Grey dying and breaking the heart of her longtime love, Cyclops. Well, sometime after that, Scott Summers, a.k.a. Cyclops, met and fell in love with a female pilot named Madeline Pryor, who just happened to bear a very striking resemblance to Jean Grey. Well, Scott and Madeline would get married and have a son named Nathan. This would lead Scott to leave the X-Men, but then it was revealed that Jean Grey was actually alive, and Scott would abandon his wife and child to form X-Factor and would kind of wind up renewing his relationship with Jean in the process. Anyway, not too long after that, uh, those Marauders that we had mentioned a couple times earlier, well, they for some reason attacked Madeline Pryor and kidnapped Nathan. While needing protection, Madeline sought it from the X-Men and is now currently residing with them in Australia. And now, finally, we can actually get to Inferno. While well, X-Factor members Iceman and Jean Grey are out back to school shopping with their mutant wards, aka the Exterminators, the area is attacked by a group known as the Alliance of Evil. Okay, seriously? Who calls themselves evil? It turns out that the villains are protesting the recently passed Mutant Registration Act. As they challenge X-Factor to try and stop them, Jean and Iceman begin fighting the villains while trying to contact the others. The problem is, Archangel is nowhere to be found, and Cyclops is too busy looking after a comatose beast as the latter alternates between his physical and human forms. Well, on a leave of absence from the X-Men, Dr. Hank McCoy, a.k.a. Beast, got a job at the Brand Corporation. There, he was able to isolate a hormonal extract that could give you, normal human beings short bursts of mutant abilities. Fearing that it was going to be stolen by a group of corporate spies, McCoy wound up ingesting the formula, and this resulted in him gaining his now furry appearance. Sometime after joining X-Factor, McCoy was actually given a formula that would allow him to alternate between his human and furry appearances. Although, later this would wear off, and he would eventually mutate further into more of a leonine look. Meanwhile, the Exterminators interject themselves into the battle. This comes as a risk to member Rusty Collins, as he is technically AWOL from the Navy. Then some more help arrives from an unwanted source. The Freedom Force. The Freedom Force originally started as an incarnation of the classic villain team, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Again, though, who, who calls themselves evil? Anyway, these were mutants who eventually got government support after they willingly gave up their identities and began supporting the Mutant Registration Act. It's then that Beast wakes from his coma, although it does appear that he is once again stuck in his furry form, and he and Cyclops decide to join the battle. The group then makes quick work of the Alliance of Evil. Afterwards, Freedom Force member Mystique approaches Rusty Collins and points out that signing with the MRA and joining Freedom Force would probably result in a pardon for being a wall from the Navy. However, Rusty instead chooses to turn himself in. He bids goodbye to his friends, including his girlfriend Skids, and enters the prison. The rest of the exterminators are split into two as they are shipped to separate boarding schools, with Skids, Boom Boom, and Richter going to the prestigious Phillips Academy in Exeter, New Hampshire, while Artie and Leach go to St. Simon's. At St. Simon's, Artie and Leech meet up with a wheelchair-bound orphan boy named Takeshi. Takeshi is a scientific genius with a technologically advanced wheelchair. That Leech breaks. As a result, Takeshi instead just tries bonding with Artie more than Leech, pointing out that Leech makes him feel... funny. Later, while working on an invention, Takeshi is zapped by a massive bolt of energy from the device. It is then that Artie and Leech realize that Takeshi is really a mutant. Later, while the boys are sleeping, Takeshi wakes to find a group of monsters sneaking into Artie and Leech's window. Takeshi gets into his wheelchair and races to save his new frenemies. Upon arrival, though, Takeshi's wheelchair suddenly morphs one of its arms into a blaster. It's of little use, as the monsters make off with Artie and Leech. Takeshi then tries to contact the older exterminators, but he's unable to reach them by phone. So he morphs his wheelchair in a nearby garbage can into a small chopper and flies off to the academy. Upon arrival, he informs Skids of what happened to Artie and Leech. Skids, Boom Boom, and Richter get on Takeshi's chopper and leave. The group then heads over to the naval stockades and breaks Randy out of jail. 
Elsewhere, Archangel is attacking the headquarters of mutant-hating religious organization The Right in an attempt to locate his girlfriend, Candy Southern. It turns out the group's leader, Cameron Hodge, has made a deal with a demonic entity named Nastir in order to provide demonic forces to fend off the mutant attack, while he, Hodge, sacrifices Candy. It's then that Nastir appears angry at Hodge because, as Hodge is part of the bargain, he was to provide locations of mutant infants, but the locations have not yielded any. So Nastir recalls his forces. Archangel then arrives to find he's too late. Candy Southern is dead. In retaliation, he kills Hodge. Back with Nastir, his minions arrive with Artie and Leech. Again, the demon voices his displeasure. He needs infants. The demon explains that what has been brought to him couldn't possibly defeat the techno-organic being known as Sim, allowing Nastir to take over the dimension of Limbo. As this happens, Artie is able to relay a telepathic message to the other exterminators. The group recognizes the location as being in New York City and begins heading over there, stopping off to pick up some clothing first. Unfortunately, they've been spotted by Nestir's forces. The group lands in a New York City alleyway and begins noticing some strange occurrences. The temperature is rising rapidly and garbage is piling up out of nowhere. Randy tries several times to call X-Factor. Each time he fails. Every failure, his anger begins to rise. He slams his phone down, and then Takeshi notices the phone smirking back. He tries to tell the others, but they don't believe him. Takeshi storms off, which makes it easy for Nastir's forces to get the drop on him. By the time the others realize what's happened, Takeshi's gone. Takeshi is brought before Nastir. The demon is told about Takeshi's ability, including his computer skills. Meanwhile in Australia, the X-Men relax. Dazzler and Longshot entertain the Tufts at a small bar, while Havoc is out for a jog, still feeling the pain of losing Polaris. It's then that Madeline approaches him, and the two begin flirting. Back with Storm, she's at Hexmen headquarters, watching some of x flactors exploits on the local news. It's then that she recognizes Jean Grey. Yeah, at this point, the X-Men still believe Jean Grey to be dead. Although the X-Men themselves were also actually believed to be dead, so, um... Make of that what you will. Storm rushes to Wolverine and tells him that Jean's alive. He already knows. He explains that he recognized Jean's scent when the X-Men first encountered the Marauders, but he didn't want to get everyone's hopes up. Back with Havoc, he's sunbathing when Madeline approaches him once more. Alex tries to deny that he's developing feelings for Madeline, especially since she is still technically his sister-in-law. Madeline points out that both have been left by their lovers, and she was just trying to share some mutual sentiment. She starts slinking away, but then Alex pursues her, and the two end up making love. Afterwards, Madeline gets up and leaves a sleeping Alex. She makes her way to the X-Men's computer room and gets in contact with Nastir. Madeline reminds the demon of their bargain. She wants her son. Meanwhile, Free Enforce member Destiny contacts Cyclops and Jean Grey about the whereabouts of Scott's son, Nathan. The information leads the two to the orphanage where Scott grew up. Cyclops recounts his history as the two search the ground. It's then that they realize all of the children at the orphanage are actually mutants. Scott and Jean make their way to the basement while two others make their way to the orphanage. The two are named Nanny and Orphan Maker and they begin hypnotizing and kidnapping the orphans. In the basement, Scott and Jean find dozens of suspended animation tubes, each holding a mutant baby. Jean is able to telepathically locate Scott's son, which is weird because she can only sense him, none of the others. The two begin freeing Nathan when Nastir's forces also arrive. It's then that Nanny and Orphan Maker make their way into the basement. Scott and Jean believe them to be behind Nathan's abduction. As a fight breaks out, Jean recognizes two of the children Nanny has with her. They are Jean's niece and nephew. Meanwhile, Nastir's forces make their way into the cryo babies. They take several, including Nathan. Back in New York City, Beast and Iceman rescue a kid from an attacking hot dog stand. After that, the two, along with the Beast's girlfriend Trish and her cameraman, get swallowed by a subway train. Meanwhile, Archangel gets a visit from Nastir. The demon makes an offer, but Warren refuses. Scott and Jean return to New York City. Jean can sense Nathan's fears and use them to track the infant. Unfortunately, the emotions are beginning to overwhelm her. 
Back on the evil subway, Beast and Iceman get the train to hop the tracks and launch it to the surface. Then they get it entangled in the suspension wires of the Brooklyn Bridge. This is where Trish manages to ground it with an electrical wire. Back with Cyclops and Jean Grey, their plane is attacked by Nastri's forces, which causes them to land. As they emerge, they notice all of New York City's infrastructure has been possessed and is attacking people. Beast, Iceman, and Archangel arrive, and with that, X-Factor manages to fight off the rest of the demons and return to searching for Nathan. Now, you may notice that I am referring to Scott and Madeline's baby as Nathan Summers instead of Christopher Summers, which is his middle name, and what Scott and Gene and most of the other characters refer to him as throughout this comic. Well, most comic book fans would know this character as Nathan Summers, who is the time-traveling techno-organic telepath Cable. So, that's why I'm going with it. Back with the X-Men, Madeline and Havoc are out on the town. Their date, however, gets interrupted by the Ghostbusters, who then get eaten by an elevator. Before Alex can truly take notice, Madeline teleports the two back to Australia. She then asks for a moment alone and teleports off before Alex can speak. It turns out that Madeline has returned to New York, where she visits Jean Grey's grave. She angrily flashes back to her past with Scott and smashes Jean's headstone. Her actions have been witnessed by Jean's parents, but before they can approach her, Nastri attacks and turns them into demons. Nastir then shows Madeline Nathan's capsule. Back in Australia, Havoc is able to track down the location of the Marauders. He informs Storm and Wolverine, who give the orders to pack up for New York. Meanwhile, Madeline begins inspecting some of the capsules taken from the orphanage. The sight triggers something, and suddenly Madeline sees herself in one of them. She then notices the capsule actually has her name on it. Back with the X-Men, they locate the Marauders, and a battle ensues. However, things begin to shift as the walls begin attacking both groups. Back with Madeline, she demands answers from Nastri. The demon suggests talking to the one truly responsible for this, as he has arrived. The man introduces himself as Madeline's father, though most refer to him as Mr. Sinister. Nathaniel Essex was a Victorian-era scientist who was heavily influenced by the work of Charles Darwin. Through his research, he would come across a people that he would dub Essex Factors. In other words, early mutants. He would often imprison these people and torture them through various experiments, trying to see the limits of their power and what he was able to do with them. Eventually, he would come across the mutant apocalypse, who would grant Essex immortality, transforming him into Mr. Sinister, thus allowing him to continue his twisted experiments on the mutant race. The exterminators try attempting to locate Artie Leach and Takeshi by using the local library to track down the demon's location. The library winds up attacking them. The group flees, but they do manage to make off with a map of the most likely location. Back with Nastir, he is set to Takeshi to building a supercomputer capable of opening a larger portal to the Limbo Dimension. With that, the demon will be able to take down his rival, Sim. Takeshi completes the computer just as the other exterminators arrive. The group tries to rescue the abductees while fighting off the demons. Unfortunately, they get a little too close to Leech, who accidentally nullifies their powers. With Nastir now threatening to kill his friends, Takeshi reluctantly turns on the computer. Nastir's forces then take the abducted babies up to the sky and arrange them in a pentagram. This allows the portal to open and turn New York City into a literal hell on earth. The New Mutants enter Limbo in an attempt to halt Sim's forces. Magic tries to fight off Sim, but he's more powerful thanks to the techno-organic transmode virus. He grabs Ileana's soul sword and takes possession of it. Magic teleports the new mutants away. The group is transported to the place where Magic first entered Limbo and where the X-Men died. Ileana blames herself for the death of her brother and his teammates. Ileana Rasputin, a.k.a. Magic, was only six when she was lured into the dimension of Limbo. There, she was trapped for ten years, even though in Earth time she was only gone for a few minutes. Because of that, she went from the age of 6 to 16, and this allowed her to tap into her mutant abilities. And as a result, her mental condition is, well, it's not exactly stable. Sim forces attack the group once again, and Magic teleports them out. This time, the group runs into Nastier, who offers help. If Magic marries him. Dude! She's 16! 
I mean, I know you're a demon and you're evil and all, but... God, you think even you guys would have some scruples? The New Mutants try to talk her out of it, but Magic reluctantly accept Nastir's proposal. The team teleports back to Sim, where Magic manages to take him down and reclaim her sword. As she does this, she taps into her full demonic power and transforms. With that, the group heads back to New York City. The New Mutants arrive in the demon-infested New York City as Nastir prepares to sacrifice the exterminators. However, Takeshi threatens to destroy the supercomputer. Nastir is able to stop him and then leaves to go deal with magic. Takeshi comes to and distracts one of Nastir's minions while Artie and Leech crawl under the computer and begin disconnecting its cables. The portal shuts and the exterminators are free. However, the demons are able to reconnect the computer. This enables Sim to eventually come through the portal and begin fighting Nastir. The exterminators come up with another plan as Takeshi whips up Voltron Mach 27 so the group can fly up and save the infants who are being held in the sky. The group gets attacked as they begin grabbing babies and Takeshi is once again taken captive. However, the new mutants show up to lend a hand. Takeshi is taken to Nastir, who mind controls the boy into operating the computer once again, this time to use it on Sim. However, Takeshi manages one last bit of control and takes out Nastir as well. The demon has one last trick up his sleeve and begins merging with the computer. The combined efforts of the New Mutants and the Exterminators manage to save the babies and begin preparing to save magic from the hands of her demonic groom. Back with Madeline and Sinister, she demands answers. Sinister states that he made her. Madeline points out that he was also behind the Marauders. They fight with Sinister gaining the upper hand when Madeline is abandoned by Nestir. Meanwhile, in New York City, the fight between the X-Men and the Marauders continues. For some reason, this is when Nastir's forces decide to interject themselves in the conflict. This allows the Marauders to gain the upper hand. Back with Madeline and Sinister, he asks Madeline to recall a memory from her childhood. She does, bringing up the tragic death of her best friend, Anne Richardson. Anne was struck by a car, and while she died, Madeline could hear her thoughts. The problem is, the memory really belongs to Jean Grey, not Madeline. Madeline is in actuality a clone. Back with the X-Men, they begin attacking the parts of the demonically possessed city. Colossus stops and takes notice that his teammates are acting way more aggressive than usual. He then recognizes a few of the demons from Limbo, and with that, Colossus rushes off to find his sister. Back with Madeline and Sinister, Nastir returns to give Madeline a boost of power. She breaks free from her bonds and proclaims herself the Goblin Queen. She then joins Nastir and Nathan and leaves. The X-Factor crew continues their search for Nathan, that is until they run into Nastir and Madeline. Cyclops calls off any attack out of fear for Madeline and Nathan's safety. Madeline points out that Scott is responsible for all of this and six her demonic forces on X-Factor. Jean tries to read Madeline's mind only to keep hitting a psychic barrier. Madeline continues ranting and attacks Cyclops. Even Nastir tries to halt her, only to get shot down. X-Factor begins fighting off demons while Jean tries once more to contact Madeline. That is until Madeline sicks the demons who were once Jean's parents on her. Madeline swears to destroy Jean and then use Nathan as a human sacrifice. Then the X-Men arrive on the scene. Unfortunately, just when things seem to start kicking into gear, we now have to grind this to a halt and go conclude the New Mutants storyline. Magic attacks Sim as a combination of the New Mutants and Exterminators begin looking for her. Meanwhile, Colossus is doing the same, and he winds up getting jumped by a group of demons and then brought to Sim and Magic. Magic confirms that the body is Pieter's, and she unleashes a blast at Sim. The light from this attracts the attention of the others. Colossus comes to as the New Mutants try to fly Magic away. The big guy attacks Sim, who then shows Pieter what happened to Ileana. Out of shame, she teleports herself and the New Mutants back to Limbo. Except this Limbo is different. This is a Limbo in an earlier time, back when Ileana was still a little girl. Wolfsbane grabs a hold of the young Ileana, and while her older self tries to kill her, Wolfsbane argues that they could make it so Ileana was never in Limbo to begin with. With that, Magic unleashes all of her power in an attempt to rewrite the timeline. Sadly, in the process, Wolfsbane loses her grip on the young Ileana. 
the New Mutants find themselves back in New York City, where Sim's forces have been destroyed. Sadly, they must break the news to Colossus that his sister is gone. All that is left of her is her armor. Pietro then notices something crawling around inside the armor. He cracks it open to find Ilyana, restored to her younger self. This basically marks the end for the Exterminators. They would eventually be folded into the New Mutants not too long after this. And while Sim's forces are gone, Nastir and his forces still remain. That's right. We still have five more parts of this storyline to go. Wolverine makes out with Jean. He's checking to see if it's really her. She blasts him. Figures. While X-Factor tries to figure out if the X-Men are actually real, Madeline takes a more normal-looking form and calls for Havoc and the others to save her. The two teams break out in a fight with the X-Men calling X-Factor mutant hunters and X-Factor after the X-Men for trying to protect Madeline. Or because Logan really wanted to have sex with Jean. I don't know, I, I just can't tell anymore. So they fight and 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 fight. Finally, Madeline leaves with Nastir. Havoc gives pursuit while Cyclops tries to talk his brother down. Havoc eventually catches up to Madeline and Nastir. It's then that he realizes that X Factor was right. But he doesn't care anymore. He swears loyalty to the Goblin Queen. Yeah, the Summers brothers rarely see eye to eye on things, not counting the recent X Access storyline. I don't know, I usually just chalk it up to the fact that Alex got adopted while Scott got left at the orphanage. Madeline gets a hold of Jean and begins holding her hostage. She points out that the demons who serve her remain on Earth. She then whips up another horde of demons to attack the two X teams. The X Men and X Factor both bungle their attacks so badly that they begin fighting each other once again. Eventually, Cyclops manages to get off an optic blast at Madeline, but the Queen merely pulls the demon who was once Jean's father into it. She then manages to revert Archangel back to being the Horseman of an Apocalypse. After that, she sicks havoc on Cyclops. Thankfully, Archangel has one last bit of strength and frees Jean. Jean manages to straighten out the two X teams, except for Havoc, who still wants to fight his brother. Finally, Jean and Madeline square off. Madeline is able to fend off Jean's blows by using Nathan as a human shield. Madeline brings up Anne Richardson in an attempt to catch Jean off guard, but Jean rejects it. Back with Havoc and Cyclops, Alex has the upper hand on his brother until Archangel knocks Havoc over the side of a cliff. Scott dives to save his brother. Fortunately, though, Warren is able to catch Havoc and save his life. Alex finally comes to his senses and joins with his brother in one final assault on Madeline. Meanwhile, Madeline informed Jean of her backstory, including Sinister. Jean manages one last psychic blast just as Cyclop and Havoc begin their assault. Madeline drops Nathan, but Scott catches his son as the demons disappear and New York reverts to normal. Madeline Pryor is dead. There is no time to mourn, though. There is still one last battle to be fought with Mr. Sinister. Jean is able to track Sinister back to, of all places, the Xavier School for the Gifted. A group consisting of Jean, Cyclops, Storm, Wolverine, and Archangel begins searching the grounds of the abandoned mansion. Meanwhile, a second group consisting of Rogue, Psylocke, Havoc, Colossus, Iceman, and Dazzler make their way into the basement. There, they get jumped by Marauders members Blockbuster and Sabretooth. The group makes quick work of the villains. Meanwhile, Jean makes a horrifying discovery. Sinister has rummaged through all of the personal documents pertaining to every member of the X-Men. It's then that they are attacked by Polaris. Storm takes her down and orders the Malice Persona to leave Polaris's body. Polaris points out that it's too late. If Malice leaves, both will die. So the X-Men tie her up and begin probing her mind to figure out what they can about Sinister. It's then that Sinister chooses to attack. Polaris emerges from the wreckage just as Sinister arrives. He picks up Jean, looking forward to playing with her. He then orders Polaris to kill the other X-Men. This is when Longshot arrives. He manages to distract Sinister long enough for Beast to attack. This enables the other X-Men to come to, and Cyclops confronts Sinister. 
Sinister prevents Cyclops from firing an, off an optic blast and begins mocking Scott. This seems to be vaguely familiar to Cyclops. It's then that Rogue attacks and tries to use her absorption powers on Sinister. All this leads to, though, is the villain now occupying her mind. It's then that Scott recognizes Sinister's voice. It turns out that Mr. Sinister was the doctor who first examined Scott at the orphanage. Not too long after that, the boy's powers had activated. He then spent the next year experimenting on Scott and arranging for Alex to be adopted. Sinister then explains how he created Madeline and that he was about to move in on her and Scott when Jean suddenly reappeared. So now he wants to work on the real thing. Unbeknownst to Sinister, the other X-Men have been psychically working on a plan. Archangel springs up and takes out Polaris while Rogue, Wolverine, and Colossus attack Sinister. This allows Storm to get Jean away from the villain. Jean comes to while Havoc begins hitting his brother with a plasma blast, supercharging Scott's powers. This enables Cyclops to blow Sinister to pieces in one shot. In the aftermath, it's revealed that Polaris escaped during the melee, and the Summers brothers finally make amends. Later, the X-Factor members hold a funeral for Madeline. Afterwards, they set about trying to return the kidnapped infants to their homes or to an orphanage. Along the way, they encounter Nanny and Orphan Maker again. The group makes quick work of the two, and Jean's niece and nephew are rescued in the process. Then they leave the orphan mutants with the Freedom Force. Also, the Blues Brothers show up for some reason. You know, I really wanted to like this comic. I really did. Now, maybe I confused it with an earlier storyline, but I always thought of Inferno as one of the big-time definitive X-Men stories. And while there were some good parts that happened in here, it took a long time to get to some of those good parts. And, to be honest, most of the X-Men stuff, well, was just really confusing. Uh, to me, the best part of the comic was the stuff with the Exterminators. It flowed nicely, there was good banter, everything seemed to build in nicely. But other parts just, they just seemed so forced. I mean, like I said earlier, the X-Men story suddenly grinds to a halt so that we can finish the New Mutants story. Not to mention, there are some major art inconsistencies here. Now look, I'm not trying to harken back and say we need Herb Trimpey drawn like Rob Liefeld, but there's still some big continuity gaps. For example, this is how X-Men 243 ends, and then when the story picks back up in X-Factor, this is how that story begins again. Notice the difference? Man, and because this thing is just all over the damn place, I've got no choice. I have to give this an F. Well, thankfully that's over, and maybe again we'll finally pick something. Maybe that's a little bit better to do on the next episode. Let's see.